by the Council of Bishops, the United Methodist Women, the General Board of Church and Society, and the General Commission on Religion and Race to explore, unpack, and move deeper into conversations about how the people of the United Methodist Church can take seriously the call to dismantle racism. So um, today uh, we are joined by some of our um, leaders who have paved the way for what is the modern day struggle for civil rights, freedom, equity, and anti-racism. I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves um, because you can hear more from them and about their work uh, within their own words. All right, um, so you all look, it looks like everyone is muted, um, but Claire, would you mind coming off of mute and introducing yourself? I'm Claire Esther and I was uh, born in Memphis, Tennessee baptized at Centenary United Methodist Church, was very fortunate to um, have as my pastor uh, and dear friend, Reverend James Mars Lawson. And he uh, actually was my mentor. He encouraged uh, members of our congregation to become engaged in the sanitation strike that was going on in Memphis. Uh, I moved to Mobile in 1970, and I joined Tomanville Warren Street United Methodist Church here. Um, I also served at a United Methodist Women's National Mission Institution, uh, Dumas Wesley Community Center, for 36 years and uh, retired in 2006. I'm currently on my way out as National Vice President of the United Methodist Women. Um, and that's pretty much my history. I've been in, engaged in civil rights movements uh, in Mississippi, Alabama, and in my hometown, Memphis. Great, thank you. Bishop Martinez. Yes, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm uh, born and raised in Seguin, Texas, near San Antonio, uh, grandson of immigrant uh, grandparents uh, who came to the United States in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, uh, baptized uh, Methodist after my dear maternal grandmother who had been baptized by a circuit rider in the little town of Ciudad Mier, Tamaulipas, on the border, had joined the Methodist Church in Seguin, 1931. I was born in 1940 and received the baptismal waters there. Been involved in uh, ordained ministry, uh, ministries of the church, uh, all my adult life. Uh, participated in uh, a number of social justice movements, including the anti-war movement, including the uh, United Farm Workers struggles, both in Texas and the Midwest, and was privileged to uh, participate in a variety of uh, engagements with my sisters and brothers in the diverse community of United Methodist Church over time. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share and to be a part of the panel uh, during this uh, critical, important time, both in our nation, but uh, throughout the world. Uh, my privilege to be with you. All right, thank you, Bishop Martinez. Reverend Lawson? I'm J Jim Lawson. I'm a uh, retired United Methodist pastor I am the son, the grandson of an escaped slave. My dad was born in Canada. My mother was born in Jamaica. So I'm a first a generation immigrant family person. And from, 19, from 1958 till 1968, I worked closely with Dr. King in what uh, I call the Nonviolent Movement of America, as a pastor, 
and as a volunteer in that struggle. And I'm now called uh, Emeritus Pastor of Holman United Methodist Church in LA, where I pastored for 25 years. Great, thank you. Sue? Uh, my name is Sue Thrasher. I uh, grew up in a little town called Savannah, Tennessee, not far from Memphis. Um, I was lucky, I was, uh, I'm a longtime Methodist, was raised in the Methodist Church. I was lucky enough to arrive in Nashville, Tennessee in the fall of 1961, which was shortly after Reverend Lawson left Nashville, I believe, but his legacy was still there in terms of a very vibrant um, community of people and uh, in terms of a vibrant nonviolent community of people involved in the freedom struggle. So as a young person, as and I was a student at Scarrett College at the time, and I was privileged to meet uh, this phenomenal level of leadership that Nashville had. Um, Reverend C.T. Vivian was in Nashville at the time. John Lewis was the president of the local uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee chapter. Bernard Lafayette, Bernard and his wife, Colia Lafayette, were still in Nashville. So it was a very uh, wonderful time for me and a life-changing time for me because as I slowly began to get involved in things, I had this community of support and mentorship and leadership surrounding me. Um, I uh, worked at the Methodist Publishing House for a year while I considered being a short-term missionary for the Methodist Church, but my involvement in the freedom movement led me to make a decision to stay at home and work here. I was particularly interested then and still am to this day in how white people work with other white people to encourage them to change their attitudes and practices around issues of racism. So I worked uh, in social change organizations for 20 years. That included uh, working with the Highlander Research and Education Center in East Tennessee. Uh, and where I work closely with Miles Horton, who is still living at the time. So I feel that I've had a uh, great privilege in terms of the people who have mentored me and taught me along the way, and feel that that's one of the parallels we may be talking about today in terms of leadership. Great. Thank you all. Welcome. Um, thank you for agreeing to share your experience and wisdom with, with us. My apologies for the technical difficulties that I was experiencing earlier, and now I realize that no one else was, but it's all been fixed. So um, we're going to have a great conversation. So I, I want to start us off this way. Um, recently, with the death of Congressman John Lewis, we were, we've been reminded that this journey to justice is not new. It is part of a historical march uh, toward freedom and liberation for all people that has been ongoing in this country and all over the world for some time now. You all have been meaning meaningfully a part of that, that historical and even the present march for justice. Um, our bishops, in initiating this whole um, pressing on to freedom, have said, however, that the United Methodist Church, our engagement in this movement has to be different. That this is a moment that we must lean into in a way that we've never done before. So there's an urgency um, and a sense of, of determination that we make our voice heard. As you reflect on your journey um, and, and the role that you've played historically in pressing on to freedom, what would you make of this particular moment? Bishop Martinez, I'm gonna start with you. Um, how is this moment different or significant uh, in a way that we should all be paying attention to? I think uh, what we're living through right now on a variety of levels, both in the sphere of uh, the racist, racist ideologies that seem to dominate and emanate from all sorts of uh, places in our culture uh, here in this country and around the world, which uh, pertain to a uh, 
commitment to uh, supremacy of one group over another, just contradictory in, to the gospel. I'm reminded that uh, Jesus uh, was always uh, bringing into the center of the story uh, the Samaritans, the widows, uh, the children, the lepers, and that in the center of his journey and teaching were, quote, the nobodies and the disposables and those who are of no uh, value to the larger society. And so I think what happened in Minneapolis to our brother Floyd, what happened in El Paso with a racist and xenophobic slaughter of the innocents and has been repeated again and again is a continuing contradiction that the church can no longer evade, the church can no longer practice uh, appropriate uh, uh, well-wishing and uh, calling on us to pray and, and, uh, and be mindful of the suffering of others. I think the time has come for the church to embrace as a core commitment at, at every level, as you have stated in our call to this, uh, this conversation, a multi-level from uh, the local church all the way through our connection all over the world, wherever we're in mission together, uh, to challenge that uh, doctrine that uh, undermines uh, the teachings of Jesus who, uh, who valued all, died for all, and calls us to love and serve and sacrifice for all. I would say that this is a time for every United Methodist, uh, every person of conscience, to be willing, sisters and brothers, to listen to all the voices, to include all the languages, to welcome all the gifts and to commit ourselves as God's children to not pretend to be any better than anyone else or any less than anyone else. That is the call. That is Jesus speaking to us, I think, through scripture and through the testimony of the saints. So this call, um, do, do you think that the call that has been issued now uh, through the, the events that are taking place around the world uh, lead us to a vision that is um, similar or distinct from the call that you all received um, participating um, injustice at the border or being a part of freedom rides and civil rights movement. Is the vision the same or is there some distinctiveness about it? Clara, why don't you start us? The vision is the same uh, because the vision has not been met. We have not entered into visions that I had in the 60s. We are not there yet. And so we're still struggling to secede with visions that we have had over the years. The difference in now and then uh, is that everybody is engaged in this movement. There has not been a city that has not had a victim like George Floyd to occur in their own hometown. And so when what happened in Minneapolis took place. It was an, it set people on fire that were locked down in a pandemic, watching on the news day after day, hour after hour, the knee 
taken away the last breath of a man with no concern as he cried out for his mother and cried out that he could not breathe. The issues have not been resolved. And the, the good thing about now is that this country is ignited around this movement of the racism that has existed in our country for years and years. And this is the right time to jump in as a United Methodist denomination and say enough is enough and that we need to change our policies. We need to change who we love. We need to change our structure of who we are, why we exist and become what the book of social principles say we are as a denomination. Uh, when, I, when I look at visions that I have today, I see us working together on criminalization of people of color. I see us working together on climate justice concerns that's causing all sorts of issues in our country today. In the 60s during the sanitation strike, economic inequality was the issue. Economic inequality is the issue still today. Healthcare, where we have mothers that cannot give healthy births or lose babies um, at early stages. Those are issues that we need to be looking at as a church working together, believing that we are a church for all God's people. And when God's people hurt, we hurt. And that's what the church should be. Uh, we need to be also addressing concerns and helping to educate around what defunding the police department means. Because it's not like you just take the funds away, but you place funds and categories in areas where they're needed. If it's domestic violence, you send those officers. If it's a mentally challenged case, you send those counselors that have been program, process, and training to go into that kind of environment. My vision, Aaron, is of a church that was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I read about it either in the second edition of When Helping Hurts or Toxic Charity, I can't remember, but it was a white United Methodist church. And when, when I think about a vision of how we can move forward, this church was a railroad track away from one of the lowest income areas, which was a black community in Memphis. And under normal circumstances, membership would have gathered and discussed how they could buy property someplace else and move their congregation there compared to staying where they were located. Instead, there were several young people that moved, went into that community, renovated houses, and then moved into the house. They became part of that crime-infested, drug-infested community. And they politically got involved. They went to the school system. Property values increased in that neighborhood, and other things started improving because there were young white families saying, this is where we're residing and we wanna see this neighborhood be the best neighborhood it can be. That's my vision where we can come together and iron out and work out our differences and make this world a better place. That's profound. Others, thoughts about the vision? The vision to me, starts at the beginning where we kind of have to err and relearn what we have been taught as white United Methodists because we have been taught a history that has not been completely true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to see anti-racist individuals developing and coming out um, and doing more 
and seeing a future that can embrace all of us. And if we become the church, the United Methodist Church, that is possible if we work together. And I think that power and money has separated us. I think that leadership has separated us. And in the black church, I'm not even certain how vital we are in this denomination anymore. Mm. I think that um, the, your point about um, historically not knowing the whole story, which was uh, something that we touched on in the last um, uh, town hall meeting, um, is such an important piece because there are so many people whose stories we don't hear. Um, and it really does call for us to, to think in a way that um, is all encompassing of all of the justice movements that are connected to this, this, uh, this idea of anti-racism. Um, so there are, uh, there are, as we talk about this vision um, that we're casting in the United Methodist Church and beyond, there are churches, uh, there are pastors and laity who are leading and serving in churches that are resistant to this vision of us all working together of the vision of anti-racism. Uh, there may even be hostility to the idea that black lives matter. Um, and so those pastors and lay people are wondering, you know, what do we do? How do we raise our voice? How do we raise consciousness in places where there is this resistance? Uh, Reverend Lawson, do you have some thoughts about, about uh, these, these places where um, there is still a reluctance to acknowledge racism or white privilege and what our leaders both lay and clergy do in the in the face of that well friends um i appreciate the various comments that have been made on how we match this moment um, i want to try to suggest however that not simply the United Methodist Church, but Christianity as a whole um, has to re-examine the forms of Christianity that have been taught and practiced. Because I happen to think that the racism is a part of a world system. The 16th century exploratory expansion conquest period of Western civilization in Europe that went to, into Africa, North America, Black, uh, South America, Asia, uh, carried almost every boat had a Bible on it and priests and monks of the Roman Catholic Church. So they presented a Christianity in the United States that was more the instrument of the empire than an instrument of Jesus. Now, I think that's a bad statement for me to make uh, and a hard statement for me to make. So I think Christianity, United Methodist Church has a different task. We have to try to somehow dismantle in our messages, in our programs and structures every form of the racism, of the sexism, of the violence, and of the plantation capitalism that was exported into North America, South America, Africa, Asia, India, and so forth and so on. Because very often the Bible went in the name of the queen or the king. So that form of religion has to be specifically challenged and dismantled. So I would say to you that a great number of United Methodist people are more influenced by the spiritual poisons that emanate out of racism, sexism, violence, and plantation capitalism than they are influenced by the spirit of Jesus and the prophetic religion of the Bible. 
So I happen to think that Christianity in the United States and the world must uh, have a conversion process and a sanctification process using two good Wesley terms, which I think are valid still. We must go through a conversion process and a sanctification process where we get rid of those spiritual poisons. So it's not, in my mind, I cannot be anti-racist if I am not anti-sexism because they're too interrelated. And I cannot be anti-racism and anti-sexism if I'm not non-violent or anti-violence. If I'm not interpreting Jesus from a non-violent or soul force perspective. And I do not think then that I can really be anti-racist if I am not anti-plantation capitalism. Plantation capitalism is the form of most of the economies of the world, which is why all across our country, we've had slavery take the land from the indigenous people. <laughs> we've had poor wages, poor benefits. We refuse to do a healthcare system of a quality character that can embrace and is accessible to every boy and girl anywhere in the country. And we've refused to have a quality education system that will allow the nation to become uh, uh, far more prepared mentally and otherwise to love God and to do the work of the 21st century. So Reverend Lawson, then let me ask you this. How, how does a pastor lead a process of conversion and sanctification in their congregation? How, how does a lay person encourage the folks that are in their Sunday school class or uh, their Wednesday night Bible study that um, this process of conversion and sanctification is necessary? How do they begin to take those first steps? What does that look like? That's 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 a very tough question. Um, you did begin it by saying, "How does a pastor?" Well, I'll, and I'll go from that since that's been my work. Mm -hmm. I think I think a pastor tries to see to it that the worship service is such that it is holistic about Jesus and the scriptures. So that's why I think that the pastor should wrestle with the lectionary every Sunday. This doesn't have to be mandatory, and he, you can provide other lectionaries because there are all the lectionaries possible. All the readings for the Sunday are not, not really complete. There's, there's, there are issues. Um, and the, it, it, the, the effort needs to be to bring all the stories of the scripture into the worship service over a period of a year or two years, three years. And the music and the prayers be connected to that. So a holistic um, preaching of the scriptures. And I think as a major factor, we ought to stop preaching from the Bible around the question, are you saved? Are you a disciple of Jesus? We should, should fundamentally be preaching from the point of view of the Bible that records a 1500 year encounter of God with people asking the question, what kind of person should you be? What kind of lives ought we to live in the light of the, God's grace and creation, in the light of God's grace for human life and the power that God has given us as uh, living persons, uh, male and female. So uh, I, I think that, well, as a pastor, uh, I always had to work in my congregations to amend United Methodist Sunday School literature, which I tended to use religiously, because United Methodist literature for Sunday School didn't go far enough. It really, 
I noticed this in the 60s, especially. So at Centenary, we tried to have sessions with our Sunday school teachers uh, how you add elements from the scripture that deal with the issue of not being a hater of other people not despising people, not have being and not being racist or sexist. Because our literature in compromise with the southeastern and other parts of the country uh, did not really push the fact that uh, love your neighbor as yourself in the Old and New Testament alike and in Moses and Jesus <laughs> is an arbitrary uh, wish of God that all the people of the earth be our neighbor. Not just our intimate family, but the extended family and the congregation and the community where we lived in the nation and the earth. Uh, but our literature, way, way back, hedged <laughs> very often on the issue of the neighbor. Uh, would not spell out the human sins that um, uh, distorts uh, the neighbor. So uh, I think within the church, we have to stop compromising the teaching of Jesus that permits people to be sinners who are racist and sinners who are male chauvinists and sinners who have violent thoughts about their neighbors and about one another and sinners who then uh, support, uh, who, who, who say such stupid things as a, a baby born into poverty uh, is at fault for the poverty. <laughs> so what I hear and what you're saying, Reverend Lawson, is um, who, who we are and who we are being as uh, children of, of God in the world matters. And what we preach, what we sing, what we read, what we discuss, you know, and how we do it, all are indications of our faithfulness in discipleship, um, which is an ongoing conversion process uh, that needs to happen in every life, every church, you know, ongoingly. I agree. I think conversion and sanctification are two big theological ideas, biblical ideas that the church must re-engage. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a that's not a belief system business. It's not a do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior? Or you cannot really believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior if you are not following Jesus. Right. In my judgment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Concluding who Jesus is comes through discipleship to Jesus <laughs> and discovering the heart and mind, spirit and soul and activity and ministry of Jesus uh, as being authentic for yourself and for your congregation. Great. Can I add something, uh, Aaron? Please. Yes. Uh, let me uh, appreciate uh, Jim's analysis and uh, really very thoughtful and uh, challenging for, for pastors in their parish. And with a lot of experience, uh, he has uh, traveled that path. I would also add that the pastor's engagement in public life, in the public square, if you will, where the futures of a community, the debates, the values, the struggles are, are played out. Uh, that the engagement of the pastor in that kind of, 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 of ministry of presence and of, and of uh, service, we're ordained as clergy to word, sacrament, order, and service. And if we do not take that seriously, we become isolated uh, and or priests, if you will, and pastors only to that, uh, to the people in the congregation and, 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 and never really engage the wider uh, pain and the grief 
that abounds in the lives of those who pass under the shadow of the cross in our congregations day by day, and they're almost like non-persons to, to many. So I, I would add only to what uh, Reverend Lawson is saying, uh, that we, as we do that engagement, and as pastors, we become present beyond um, the confines of our kind of assigned roles as clergy within the life of the church or conference, that it will be impossible to deny the grief and the pain. And those will become, I think, motivating uh, factors and, uh, and will prick conscience and call us forth into more courageous teaching, preaching, and witnessing uh, in whatever uh, assignment we have. And I just want to add one more thing. Unless we're willing to go off the map, off the terrain that we're comfortable in, we will not, I think, be empowered to work for the kind of future, Aaron, that you laid out in in, uh, as the call of the church for this time and, and the vision that uh, Clara laid out and Jim has spoken to. So I, I don't think we ought to be confined to a specific role except following where Jesus leads us. And quite often it's into the public square and not into the prayer chapel. Yeah. Well, Aaron, may I just add one word? The, sure. the appointment... Uh, underneath the paragraphs in the discipline about a uh, pastor appointment, there used to be a sentence that the pastor is appointed to the congregation and to the community Ooh. in which the church Absolutely. is located. I mean, that, yeah. that for me has always been a major piece. I'm, <laughs> I pastor this congregation centenary, but at the same moment, I, I've got to be concerned for the jobs my people have in the community. I've got to be concerned for Memphis as a city <laughs> and as a people. So, so it seems to me that that that, par that word in the script in the in our discipline for me has been a very powerful guide to my life and ministry. So, I don't think a pastor. We've never. I've never heard bishops emphasize that with the appointment but I've read the discipline over and over again and use it as a model and uh, that paragraph plus the paragraph that used to be paragraph 206 that said the local church uh, um, I, I'm trying to remember what the words say but we used to talk about um, a strategic base for the ministries of Jesus uh, in the world. Paragraph 206, I don't know what that paragraph is now, but mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a high school student, I fastened on that paragraph. The local church, strategic base right. for the ministries of Jesus yeah. in, in the world. So, uh, to me, those, those big calls in the discipline um, have been very important for me all my life. All right. I wanted to turn just a little bit, and then there are a few questions that have come in from those who are viewing that I wanted to squeeze in. We're close to the end of our time, but I'm going to see if we can, can push a little bit more because I think there are some things in some of these questions that everyone really needs to hear. Um, but, Sue, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss it to you. Um, there are lots of questions about what um, white Christians, United Methodists, should be doing at this time. As you think about, reflect on your own role in the civil rights movement as an ally, what would you say to, to white Christians, white United Methodists, about their role in this ongoing struggle for justice and equity um, and anti-racism now? Well, I think the short answer to that is be involved. But... Uh, I want to go back to uh, the discussion we were having earlier. This is an, um, we have an amazing opportunity now 
I think, because of this historic moment that we're in, both in terms of the movement that we're seeing for justice and also in terms of the pushback that we are experiencing. Uh, otherwise, we have an administration now of our leadership that is actually giving permission for the other side of this coin to come forward in the country that is opposed to racial justice and equity. So I think it is a very important historical moment and uh, a good time to become involved in things. What was important for me was, I remember sitting in a church in Nashville and listening to the ministers who spoke at these mass meetings. And I remember thinking to myself, I can either be on the side of the future or I can be on the side of the past. And I think we're at that moment again in our history where people can choose to be on the side of the future. And if they do that, then it means working uh, to create something that's different. I don't think there's an easy answer for that. I don't think you, um, because you have, you come to that understanding or that consciousness that you know exactly what you are to do. I'm a great advocacy for action. I think that people change, uh, their consciousness changed, they grow and learn because of participating in action. I don't think it always has to be a demonstration or a direct action, but I think people need to get engaged and get involved and find ways to do that. Moreover, I think you have to do that every morning. I think you, when you wake up every morning, you have to consciously think about what you're going to do today to leave the world a little bit of a, in a better place than it was before. So I don't think it's, you can't coast just because you have been involved in something. You have to keep finding the answers. And I don't think the answers are there. And Miles Horton used a term, Miles and Palo Freire used a term, making the road by walking. And I think that's what's before us as Methodists and as white people who want to become engaged in something, that we simply have to try to do things and we make our road by walking that road. But we get out there and we do the walking and we do the action that's required of us in this moment. Great, thank you. I'm going to I'm going to do a quick um, rapid. I'm going to come back to you, Bishop. So just hold that thought and then put sure. it in with with what I'll what I'm asking. Uh, one last round of, of conversation based on some of the things that I'm um, hearing from uh, the conversations that's happening online. Um, so, Clara, talk a little bit about women. You know, you serving with UMW and the role of women uh, in the movement, uh, the role of uh, black women and the power of their vote. Um, what would you how would you reflect on the the um, the power that women have to bring change um, and greater justice and equity uh, in in the world today? Women over the years have been the caretaker of all people. And in doing that, we have empathy, we have compassion, we have a different level of love. Not that men don't, but women normally have cared. And United Methodist Women is a strong organization that speaks out for injustices. And I, I, I reflect back to the 1940s when white women in the South stood up against lynching. And, and that's just so um, incomprehensible to me that in 1940, we had white women saying this was wrong. We have to engage young women uh, to bring them on board. And I'm hoping that through the movement today of Black Lives Matter, that United Methodist Women can embrace that population of people uh, that are out there actively saying, we need to do something. Uh, because that's what we have been doing for over 150 years now. Uh, but because we have more uh, compassion, I think, for our children, and women that are hurting. Um, that's just who we are, Erin. We have uh, been involved in voter education, voter rights. Uh, 
We have been writing letters. Uh, we are running for physicians. We have a, a, a vice president of possibility with, with a black woman now. Uh, the movement and the conversations uh, and women have stood up and moved on rather than being housewives for years and years and being sort of controlled to some extent by the husbands. They're speaking out more and engaging more. Uh, but I think we need to be involved from children to the oldest of the oldest um, saying, what are your concerns? What are your issues? How can we deal with this? How can we confront and embrace the problems that we are going through today in America? Thanks, Bishop Martinez. So you talked a little bit about going off the map. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about you is the way in which you have uh, served as a cultural bridge builder, um, kind of walking this line between um, race and socioeconomic uh, status and language and kind of bringing the richness of a variety of forms of diversity uh, to, the, to the forefront as you engage uh, questions of, of, of anti-oppression. So, you know, can you talk just a little bit about your own journey uh, in, in being that kind of cultural bridge builder, you know, pulling a little bit from all of the, the movements that, um, that have uh, led us on the justice path and in, in encouraging us even now to continue to think about this in ways that we haven't and maybe bring um, voices to the table which are historically ignored when we talk about subjects like racism. Well, very briefly, I know we're uh, running a bit short of time. Uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned earlier at another point that uh, my paternal grandmother was Apache from the state of Coahuila mm -hmm. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I made it my business to, uh, as a pastor, to engage and listen to, to all the voices. You know, I've learned a lot from all my brothers and sisters in the struggles in the neighborhoods and the local churches and the national division and the uh, general conference and the council of bishops, the African bishops, the Filipino bishops. The, I've, I've been blessed by that. So I think we need to, to celebrate that. And I want to say by the United Methodist women that Prior to uh, my time period as a pastor and, and servant in Christ's Holy Church, the women were there for us. They were the vessel that, that sustained, and uh, they were the torch uh, before some other structures came into being. I, I bless uh, the work of United Methodist Women. I do, I do think that unless... Uh, no matter your ethnicity, your racial heritage, your, your tribal identity, unless you're willing to engage beyond your, uh, your uh, community of origin, whatever it is, and, and with the premise that you have something to learn and something to receive, but also something to share with the other communities, then I think you're going to be a very impoverished um, leader in Christ's holy church. So I, I just want to just say that and testify to that. I'm a debtor to many, many whom I could name today in that journey. I worked in the National Division in the 70s. The National Division of the GBGM was the most diverse, most socially conscious, uh, mm -hmm. most racially inclusive and committed to justice of any entity in the whole wide world. Worldwide United Methodist Church. I, I, I just celebrate that. I was just blessed by that. John Graham. Uh, oh my Lord! Uh, so many wonderful people that I met there. Now, let me tell you. Let me close with this because I know we're we're moving on. You're asking us how do we get off the map? How do we go beyond our comfort level? How do we how do we venture and experiment and improvise beyond what? is known to us at the moment. Dolores Huerta, co-founder of the United Farm Workers, 
one fine day in the dusty town, Central Valley of California, was trying to get people to uh, participate in the March of Sacramento. And people were on the sidewalk just kind of looking, just wondering what was going on. And Dolores stopped those who were already marching, turned to the people on the sidewalk and said the following, don't be a marshmallow, get off the sidewalk, march with us into justice history. Sisters and brothers, we can either stay on the sidewalk as bystanders and let the forces that Jim described earlier to us have the day, or we can get off the sidewalk and march into justice history like Jovita Idar, a Methodist young woman in Laredo, Texas, stood up to the Texas Rangers barred them from entering the newspaper where she worked. They were going to destroy it because they had published articles critical of the Texas Rangers. That kind of witness, that kind of commitment to get off the sidewalk, it's up to every United Methodist. Those of us on the panel to some extent have done it. Many others are doing it. That's my hope. Dorothy Day said one fine day, I celebrate her contribution as a lay Roman Catholic, quote, no one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless. There is too much work to do, unquote. We can't give up the hope. Jim at his age, me at my age, the rest of you at your age, and all ages in between. Let's get off the sidewalk and off the map. Yeah, there have been a number of questions that have come in that are asking kind of, how do I do this? How do I, you know, how do I get off the, how do I get off the, you know, the sidewalk? What does it, you know, how, what are the first steps that I can take? And, um, you know, I think that that's something that we'll need to explore more, um, you know, of, but, you know, also people searching their own hearts because the, the work of the spirit does give us the steps to take if we are um, open and available to it. Um, and I think that our surroundings call us forth into action as well. So paying attention, listening to what's happening in our communities gives us actions to yeah. take, I think, as well. Um, so Reverend Lawson, there was a question talking about the parallels between during the civil rights movement when protesters were attacked with dogs and some of the, the, the um, the experiences now that we're seeing of protesters with tear gas and you know other forms of, of trying to disperse um, uh, crowds and to to uh, quell protesters. Um, as someone who educated protesters on how to do nonviolent protesting and ad, uh, and activism, what would you say to protesters who are attempting to nonviolently protest in this day? And um, there's a follow-up to that, so I'm gonna just ask you both and then you can take them together. In the 60s, did you experience anarchists who were attempting to co-opt and subvert the work of civil rights activists as what is being seen in cities like Portland and in other places uh, today? Um, yes. In and the Memphis Sanitation Strike was the place where I first discovered uh, police provocateurs who c caused the violence, a police department that did the violence, uh, professional looters who did violence. Uh, I discovered all of those very clearly in the Memphis scene in the Sanitation Strike 68. And I had conversations across the country in Portland, also Olympia, Seattle. Um, there, so let me let me answer this question this fashion. The United States is the most violent culture known to human history. We have violent spirits, racism, sexism, violence itself are forms of 
hatred and violence. Plantation capitalism is an institutional violent entity. So the <coughs> killing of people across our history is phenomenal. Current violence, I must, let me start over. There have been over 700 cities in which there have been nonviolent demonstrations in the year 2020. These have been by and large nonviolent and actively engaged. The violence that has occurred in places like Portland, the Seattle, and any other place has been first the violence of the police forces. Uh, CIA, FBI, local police forces actively engage in provocative behavior hidden <laughs> underneath uh, a movement. So that's one thing. The anarchists are a North America phenomenon, though anarchy began in Europe. And I've talked to groups in probably 10 or 15 cities over the last 20 years who are anarchists. Uh, some of them are provocateurs from police. So what I'm simply saying is that the violent entities underneath this massive 700 city demonstrations is from the culture itself and not from Black Lives Matters. Not from the folk who have strategically planned and gotten behind the issue of um, stopping the execution of the innocent in the United States. Is that clear? You can't so, say it any so, clearer. So the, and the articles in the newspapers and what I've heard over television commentaries failed to cover simply a scholarly sociological analysis of the violence mm -hmm. and it serves the power structures of our society to sort of blend all of it together so that the people don't really see the extent of the justice demand of uh, uh, the uh, of the overall c campaign All right. Well, I think we are close to the end of our time. I, I, there is one, one last question. If you can just give me just a, a little nugget um, that came in. Do you think that the United Methodist Church can ever be an anti-racist institution? And, you know, or, or, and, or how? Can the United Methodist Church be? Well, the, other side, the other side of that question is, can United States can the United Methodist Church become uh, more absolutely committed to the love of God and the love of the neighbor? And my answer to that is yes. Okay. <laughs> I want to quote Sojourner Truth in responding. She said one fine day, Truth, Sojourner Truth. Truth is powerful. It prevails. Jesus love in the midst of all this violence that Jim has described will prevail. I do believe our church can become different and more faithful. Yes. Aaron, I concur. I think one day that's a great possibility, but I also speak from the Southeast. It has to be intentional and it has to be a whole lot more work put on the table mm -hmm. and the right people at the table to be a part of moving forward. Um, but one day, and my mom said that to me when I questioned racism in our face in Chattanooga. She said one day, and I believe that one day can be tomorrow, but more in the next couple of years, 
in the Southeast, we can make it a possibility. Thank you all so much for sharing uh, the benefit of your wisdom with us. Um, to those who are watching, this video will be available on the um, This In Racism website. Um, we will also be creating some resources to go along with this conversation. You'll probably be hearing a little bit more from some of our panelists as a part of those resources. Um, we know that there are uh, requests from uh, the last town hall where you wanted to hear more, for example, of Dr. McLean's eight pillars of, of anti-racism. And we're working to bring that to you. You will see that um, in early September, along with some other pieces related to this. Next Wednesday, we hope that you'll join us back here um, because we'll be talking with a panel of young people to hear their reflections about their visions for the church, what they believe will, it will take to make uh, the United Methodist Church one that is faithful and committed to living in the love of God that is made real in uh, the person of Jesus Christ, um, as Reverend Lawson said, and, and, and their leadership in helping us to move off the map, as um, Bishop Martinez said. So um, until then, uh, we pray that you will take these words into heart of these leaders who have uh, paved the way for us to continue this journey of living into the fullness of who God has created us to be and who our teacher Jesus has emboldened us to be, which are transformers of the world. Uh, waking up every day, as uh, Sue said, thinking about how can we make this world a better place? It can happen uh, today, tomorrow, in the future, but as Clara said, it's going to take our commitment and our intentional effort. So with all of these jewels that our seasoned leaders um, have given us today and the many more that will be coming to you soon, uh, we wish you a great day. Continue to press on to freedom and join us here next week where we'll continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.